Every once in a while, a paper comes along suggesting that coffee may be actually good for our gut microbiome. Well, a new paper was just released. In fact, it is not even peer reviewed yet. I want to show that to you. It kind of brought this back up in my mind. I want to briefly take a look at this. So back in 2018, which when you look at from a scientific perspective is not long at all, considering we're still learning things about insulin, which was discovered well over 100 years ago, that this Lacinobacter asacrolyticus was first identified in 2018 from human feces. It was a gram-positive, obligate anaerobe, uh, non-motile, and a non-spore-forming bacillus. So not something really exciting in the world of microbiology, but it was hiding in plain sight because it may have been there for a long time, and we're just now discovering this in 2018. It also appeared to be a butyrate-producing bacteria, which is exciting because when you look at a number of studies, the short-chain fatty acid butyrate tends to be really healthy for the gastrointestinal tract, specifically the large intestine. It's a source of energy for colonocytes. Uh, it helps produce mucin or mucus, which is good for reducing friction, increasing the integrity of the, uh, the endothelial, epithelial cells down there. Uh, also, it, the butyrate has been suggested to be helpful with the immune system and turns the naive, not ignorant, but naive T cells and differentiate them into what they're eventually going to become, like T regulatory cells. So back to this initial paper, though, here's some of the characteristics of this if you kind of get into these things. I don't particularly, which is why I put them up there. But this bacteria wasn't really exciting compared to other bacteria. For example, it might have been a little longer than some other bacteria, but it tends to have kind of the, the rod shape like a lactobacillus might uh, it grows under the same circumstances, uh, temperature, pH, and quantity uh, down there in millimeters in diameter after four days on an agar plate. So kind of exciting to have found it, but not terribly exciting as a, as a, a bacteria. Now this paper, this paper itself is somewhere in the neighborhood of 154 pages, if memory serves. And what they did was they looked at, well, it took, it was a multi-cohort, multi-omic study looking at about 22,000 people spread across the U.S. and the United Kingdom and looked at food and bacteria production or uh, prevalence. And what they found, one of the strongest food microbiome associations was between coffee and this loss in a bacteria, asacrolyticus. But by the way, asacrolyticus, A means not sacro is carbohydrate or sugar. Lyticus is splitting. So this bacteria was named as such because it doesn't break apart carbohydrates real well. The strongest correlation was between this newly discovered, and they even say, uh, recently characterized butyrate-producing Lacinobacter asacrolyticus and coffee consumption. However, it was difficult to disentangle some of the aspects of this because they've largely relied on food frequency questionnaires, which are historically not super accurate, and there's a few other things. But it was a significant finding. The uh, abundance of L. asacrolyticus was 4.5 to 8 fold higher in coffee consumers compared to non-consumers. And interestingly enough, it didn't have anything to do with caffeine. Even decaffeinated coffee did the same, which led them to believe that maybe it has something to do with this quinic acid. Now, quinic acid is an anti-inflammatory. It's considered to be an antioxidant. It's considered to be a prebiotic. It's found in things like berries and some herbs like uh, elderberry and, and fruits as well as coffee, and it can combine with something else to form chlorogenic acid, which is involved in glucose regulation as one of the benefits also supposedly of coffee. Anyhow, so this study, which I know looks a little funny, that's because it's kind of a preprint thing. It hasn't been peer reviewed yet, which I'm aware of the limitations of it, but I still want to talk about it anyways. And this had to do with vigorous exercise and looking at certain uh, gut bacterial species. They took about 5,500 adults, ages around 40 to 60, and they segmented them in depending on how much physical activity they got per week. So it was sedentary, moderate, or vigorous. Now, vigorous is what we're going to talk about. So vigorous was people that engaged in at least 75 minutes of vigorous activity per week. And here's what they found. Number one, vigorous physical activity, which we're told is a good thing, was associated with a higher microbiome diversity. Now, this generally is good. This means more diversity of the gut bacteria. And it's associated with decreased disease prevalence, uh, better digestion, um, better just overall gut resilience. Uh, it also was associated with increased or enhanced pyruvate fermentation as well as purine metabolism. Now, pyruvate can get converted uh, into lactate and acetate, and those two are associated with a beneficial gut environment. Think lactobacillus, for example, and lactate acid loving. Kind of it's a good, uh, you want more of those things in general, as well as uh, purine metabolism associated with cell growth and repair. But they went on to say that L. asacrolyticus was significantly reduced in individuals performing vigorous uh, physical activity. This was interesting because the association persisted 
no matter what else they looked at. They adjusted for other covariates is what they call it, sort of like gender and BMI, still consistent diet quality, alcohol intake, and even the bottom here, notably, this bacterial species, the uh, L. asacroliticus, remains significant. Wow, when they adjusted other things, some of the other significant findings kind of dissolved or fell away, but this one remained really strong. So vigorous physical activity was associated with lower amounts of Lacinobacter A. sacroliticus. So as always, it's more questions than answers. The big one is why. Uh, is it because of the physical activity and it's a benefit in some way? Or maybe it's protective by lowering that bacteria? Or maybe because of the more inflammatory uh, environment because of vigorous physical activity that there's less of the Lacinobacter A. sacroliticus? Who knows? Would, would they get more if they recovered for a little while, took a couple weeks off? Who knows? Anyhow, but back to this initial 154-page study, they also found that Lacinobacter A. sacroliticus was lower in rural societies than they were in people that have typical Western lifestyles, is what they said. It's not found in newborns and children. They barely found it in any non-human primates. They found it in only a couple samples of ancient civilizations. And most interestingly, they said, these findings suggest that L. asacroliticus may be a relatively recent and geographically limited member of the human gut microbiome, potentially influenced by modern dietary habits and lifestyle factors. So what's the point of all this? Well, we've been wrong many times before. When you, the Earth used to be flat, some people think it still is. Pluto was a planet, now it's not. The uh, Pellegra was thought to be due to a black fly blight bite. Turns out it was just a niacin deficiency. They used to give cigarettes for asthma. Uh, cocaine for toothaches, morphine, opioids. Uh, if you were fat or overweight, you could eat parasites and that would help. Of course, mercury was really popular and you could always blow smoke up someone's rear end if they almost drowned along the Thames River in hopes that they might be revived. We've made a lot of mistakes. Well, here's a paper that says that this was right after that previous first paper. This is in 2019. They identified 2,000 bacterial species that have yet to be cultured. Do you think we know that much about the human microbiome? And in the functional and nutritional medicine industry, we should be testing it with these largely... Uh, scientifically unvalidated tests and giving a whole bunch of things to try to improve gut health when there's not a lot of research on some of the things that people are doing. That's because what we tend to think that we know is a lot less than what we actually know. So in my opinion, I think all of the functional medicine and nutritional practitioners, including myself, need to take a nice slice of humble pie. You can have some coffee with it if you want or not. But if you like this kind of information, you can always head over to metabolicfitnesspro.com where we help educate nutritional and functional medicine practitioners to help elevate their expertise, deliver life-changing and transformations for their patients, and build a thriving practice using evidence-based medicine. Thank you so much, and God bless.